Then let's go on to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Emile. Um, and interact with me today. I need your help. I came back from Helsinki, Finland yesterday. I was 16 hours on the road. I went to bed 1 a.m. So I need your help. You know, I want you to interact with me. And Emil is a good, uh, good opportunity to interact and get excited because it's a very important text. As I pointed out, there is no educational theory without uh, Rousseau's Emil. Um, uh, everybody who does education has to read Emil from cover to cover. Most of them will disagree with most of his ideas, but will be provoked by his ideas. Um, uh, he is intentionally provocative, says things which do upset you, um, but makes you think, and don't dismiss it too easy. Now, before I go into Emil, there is one more issue I would like to come back about uh, uh, um, Rousseau's social contract. I made this point briefly in last lecture, but let, let me make it sharper because in the questions I am asking questions about the general will, and I feel I may not have eva give a, give, given enough uh, meat to you um, uh, about the notion of the general will. Uh, before I go so. I have to come back because there is one more um, uh, chore, household chore. Um, one of the teaching fellows reminded me that the Smith's lecture will come at the day when the test is due. So what to do with this? What <laughs> uh, I suggest, uh, uh, I will do a preview of Smith's uh, Thursday this week. And I will put my PowerPoints before the lecture um, on the internet, so you can read the PowerPoints, OK? That will get you up in speed. I hope you still will come to the lecture, though those of you uh, who are also in varieties of capitalism course can skip, because out of the 50 lectures I'm giving this semester, this is the only one which overlaps. It is the same lecture that I was giving in the Varieties of Capitalism course. I hope you won't ask for a discount, right? That the professor did sell the same product twice, right? Uh, 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 but a a anyway, so those who did that lecture and they feel very comfortable with this can miss the lecture. But I hope everybody else will come Tuesday. All right, now, uh, Emil, uh, this is something, uh, uh, no, no, the, the general will, the general will, I didn't finish this one. So there is, right, an interesting uh, uh, contrast, uh, development uh, in Rousseau in the theory of social contract. Uh, because Rousseau especially emphasizes, right, that the social contract right, has to be, be arrived at uh, uh, by uh, um, a universal con consent. Uh, so he does emphasize that in arriving to a social contract, um, we actually uh, have to exercise some popular sovereignty. Um, and this is an idea which is only an element in Locke, right? In some ways, Rousseau moves a big step forward, contractarian theory, towards democratic theory, popular sovereignty. And in fact, universal suffrage. I mentioned he did not uh, advocate <coughs> suffrage for women, but advocated otherwise universal suffrage, uh, what Locke was not willing to do. But there is an interesting other idea in Rousseau, which is, uh, has an important kernel of truth and a very disturbing idea at the same time. And this is the idea of the general will. I talked about this as an, a good example of methodological collectivism, right? That Rousseau 
unlike uh, 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 Hobbes or Locke, or we will see later on Mill or Adam Smith, does not believe that studying the individual actions, we can understand what is society and what the need of the society is. There is a general will over society which is more than simply adding up all individual wills. Um, and this idea carried on in social theory among those whom we will discuss particularly by Emil Durkheim. And there is a clearly an element of truth to it, right? That there is some universal good, right? Uh, what is more than just the sum total of individual interest. Um, uh, when we are, uh, you know, talking about uh, health care reform, right? And the needs of governments, right? To provide health care for everybody, right? Uh, when we actually do believe that it should not be left to individual responsibility whether they have health care insurance, right? Or at least some people in this room probably believe that, right? Uh, then you believe that there is a general will, right? That you have to overrule, right, the individual uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, make a decision. And, you know, there is this general will everywhere when you go to the college, you have to get certain shots, otherwise you are not allowed into the college, right? It, do, it is not leaving up to you to decide, right, whether you are, had certain shots taken, right? You have to demonstrate to be in resident, right? There is a general will. It's uh, not assumed that every individual is a rational actor and people will not be foolish, right? And be irresponsible and not to be pro 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 properly protected, you see? This is a strong case that the idea of general will makes sense. There is some collective good, uh, but we can understand that individuals occasionally has to be forced to go by this general will, right? By the public good. But there is a big problem with the general will. Namely, if there is a general will as such, where on earth will it come from? Uh, how we will know what the general will is? And Rousseau is explicit about this, right? He confronts it. That's why he talks about the lawgiver. He said, smart people like me, we know what is good for society, and therefore we should figure out what the general will is, and then the popularly elected parliament will pass it as a law. But we are the lawgivers, right? Well, this is a very disturbing idea, right? Um, a disturbing idea which opens uh, Rousseau up to a totalitarian interpretation that he argues that the government knows better and in fact he argues that not the government but we the biased philosophers we the intellectuals we know better what people's interests are you think this is your interest no I tell you this is not your interest I know what is your interest well, this is a very disturbing idea. How on earth do I know what is in your interest? Uh, and of course, uh, Rousseau's notion of general will appealed a great deal to Karl Marx and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and Mao Zedong. They loved the idea that it is the Central Committee of the Communist Party who knows better than ordinary Chinese or Russian, what their needs are. There must be a central planner rather than individual actor which tells people what their needs are. So the problem of general will is highly problematic, right? You can, you can make a case for it that you need an assumption like that, as I pointed out, there are people in this room, right? who believe that there is general will and the common good, right? Are there people here? Anybody believes uh, that, okay, yeah, yeah, there are people in this room, of course. Uh, uh, and there are others who would not believe that. I mean, if you are an econ major, I think you got enough in economics to say no, 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 never, ever. Uh, 
Um, um, okay, now let's go to Emil because it actually has something to do in a different formulation with the same idea. So what is the story about Emil? It's uh, of course, um, he himself is Jean-Jacques um, and uh, he tells us that he is a tutor uh, of a boy Emil and educate him from the early ages until reaches adulthood and finds his wife, Sophie. I told you, of course, that this is a very idealized Rousseau because he put all of his children into orphanage, into a very lousy orphanage, and probably um, <coughs> most of them or all of them very early died in this orphanage. But, you know, uh, he still has ideas what he should have done if he would not have been a bastard and would not have <laughs> abandoned his children. So what is the table of content? First he says, well, uh, we have to rear a civilized savage, a child born in the state of nature, infancy and childhood and pre-adolescence is a gradual transformation from the state of nature into society. Uh, then um, he, uh, when uh, adolescence comes, then we have a fully formed atomic individual by now, and we have to bring that person into society. And then uh, he has this uh, very complicated idea that this transition uh, from the atomic individual and state of nature to civil society is a transition from amour de soi to amour proper. Uh, well, this is a very complex um, concept. Rousseau could have been uh, more lucid about what the difference is than he was. Uh, uh, also, uh, from English, you think you understand it more easily than you actually do, because proper in, uh, in uh, French does not mean proper. Proper also means myself. Proper only means myself in consideration with others. Soa means myself without consideration of others, right? So be careful, right? Uh, amour proper is not proper love, right? It is a self-love, but of a self-love in which I do take into consideration alter, not only ego, to put it with uh, uh, Sigmund Freud. Well, and it has to happen, otherwise we will not have citizens. He links this idea of amour proper, I will have to talk about this more, uh, in order to have citizens. And he makes a crucial distinction between the citizens and the bourgeois. This is again uh, the two faces of Rousseau, right? One face of Rousseau is uh, uh, a radical democrat, a deeply democratic individual. And the other face is uh, uh, left radical, and he's the first really, as far as I can tell, what I reasonably know, uh, the literature of these times, the first who is using the term bourgeois in a pejorative way, and makes this crucial distinction between citizen and bourgeois. Uh, and bourgeois are the selfish businessmen, right, who want to have money and do not have a commitment to the collectivity, who do not obey the general will but pursue selfish, narrow economic interest. That's bourgeois. In some ways he gives the tool to Karl Marx, right, to develop his theory as we will see later on. And Marx, of course, loved Rousseau. Not only Marx, Durkheim loved Rousseau as well. I mean, there are many people who love this character, despite his um, uh, 
shortcomings of his character. Well, uh, what are the main themes? Uh, the first important theme is nature is good, society which is corrupt. Very important proposition, um, very powerful proposition. This is something what uh, Marx also takes from Rousseau, and this is what um, Durkheim also takes from, from Rousseau. Uh, fear of death is not natural, he uh, continues. Uh, it, uh, it is forced on us, forced on us by priests, philosophers, and doctors. And the first task is negative education. Well, I will elaborate on this. I just foreshadow this block of ideas. The second one is, well, the task is to turn the savages, noble savages, that's a noble savage, right, a very Rousseauian idea, into social beings. And from amour de soi to amour proper. Well, but what makes a social, it's a lovely idea, provocative, ironic, and I just love it. What makes us social is pity, right? Um, and I will labor on this. It's really so, so wonderful. Um, and the big question is, can we be citizens without being bourgeois? What is the distinction? And then uh, he said, what is civilization? Well, civilization becomes culture, then sex is sublimated into imagination. It's very important. I, I will labor on it. And I, I hope you will be able to relate to it as much as I can. Um, uh, right? Uh, he said there are really two processes which makes us social pity and love, but not sex. It is erotic love, which is in your mind as much as, 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 as in your sexual drives. And then he suggests love develops in three stages. Uh, and I, I think this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, again, and uh, you know, I, I, I certainly, uh, I, I, I can relate to this very well, right? Um, the first stage is that you you are in love, but you don't know yet with whom. Right? Uh, you are ready for love, and you are looking for somebody to be loved, but you do, you, you don't really know yet. You did not identify yet, but there is a sense, right, that you are in love. Uh, it happens certainly for the first time in adolescence when we are 13 or 14 and we suddenly realize that there is a romantic stuff, but we don't have the object of our, our romantic feelings, right? We have to find this out. But it happens actually always when uh, one falls in love. Uh, can I tell you as an, as an old man, it will happen later to life as well. There are rarely one love in life, right? Okay, um, then uh, he says, uh, um, uh, love brings uh, different people together on the basis of differences. Uh, this is very much a Durkheimian idea, right? Uh, uh, what binds people together can be their differences. And he makes very provocative argument, uh, men and women are different. It's mostly, he's mostly read uh, as a, Mayor Chauvin is bastard, but uh, it's more complicated than this. And I, can, I will show you text what will make you think uh, without completely dismissing him, just on some very damaging quotations, what I also will show you. All right, so nature good, society corrupts. Uh, well, people in nature are good, uh, society corrupts. Well, this is the opposite argument uh, uh, to uh, uh, Hobbes or in fact, you know, Durkheim's uh, idea that you need um, uh, 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 more uh, control over society is uh, also opposed to um, uh, uh, Rousseau's f uh, f fundamental idea. 
And he said, well, in, uh, a child does not know vice and doesn't know error. Um, uh, it is introduced to the child by society. And then he got, gave this, uh, though he was not much of a believer, uh, he uh, gives a bit of theological argument. Everything is good as it leaves the hands of the author of things, God. And everything degenerates um, in the hands of man. Um, and man turns everything upside down, right? He wants nothing as nature made of. We are being told to get rid of our natural, natural, na national, uh, natural instincts. Um, uh, and this is, again, lovely, right? Man must be trained like a school horse. It's, a, it's a lo lovely. Also, uh, I, I think you sense, right, the, the, this very important distinction between training and education, right? Um, once I had a conversation with uh, Daniel Bell, a famous social scientist, uh, and uh, he said, we were talking about graduate students, and he said, you know, my colleagues are always talking about training graduate students. He said, what an outrage. You educate students, you don't train them. You train a dog. Now that's Rousseau's point, right? Training simply to giving skills and telling them how to do things, right, uh, is training. Uh, the point is education. And I hope, you know, we try to do in this course a bit of education. That's why I don't emphasize that you have to go back and memorize, you know, the citations from the authors come in and in the blue book quickly copy in what you memorize and will immediately forget, right, after the test, what we often are expected to do. That is training. Education is the process in which we force you to think on your own, right? That is education. And he said, well, uh, the problem is that that is too much training, right? Uh, like, you know, cutting back the trees, French garden, you know, they cut back everything what grows, right? Uh, to fit, you know, the, what they thought beautiful, beautiful image. It is always non-natural. And I also like this a great deal. Many of you will not agree with this. He said, fear of death is not natural. Uh, in nature, one accepts it, right? And Rousseau agrees with Hobbes, we are indeed driven by the fear of death, but this is not natural. He claims that animal accepts death, right? Well, whether it is true or not, that's another question. I mean, you, you may have seen uh, your dog dying, and you have seen fear in the eyes of a dog. So I, I'm not so sure how correct Rousseau's observation is. But there is an element of truth to it, right? That uh, uh, buffaloes, when they know it is time to die, you know, they go on their own and they lay down and wait for death in a peaceful way. That's what he suggests. He said, what is put into us, and it's, I think it's a wonderful deep idea, the fear of death by philosophers, doctors, and priests. Great idea, right? It's a very important idea that we are ruled by people who monopolize different type of knowledge. And the essence, the, the power of knowledge is that it put fear of death into us. The doctors who will say, well, I will cure you, right? Uh, the, right? <coughs> And the priest who will say you will burn in hell, and therefore you will uh, fear of death. Uh, he said, you know, naturally uh, we would know how to suffer and how to die, but we are being sort of indoctrinated to fear death and have anxieties in my life. Now, uh, this is why we need negative education. This is a very provocative idea, became extremely popular in the 1960s and 70s. Those of you who do education probably know Ivan Ilyich's work, right? He's pushing it to, uh, to the, as far as you can, right? But in the kind of uh, countercultural educational theories 
it was very important that what you need is negative education. You have to get out of those silly ideas from people's mind what society put in there. Uh, and he said, and this is again a lovely citation, our di didactic and pedantic craze is always to teach children what they would learn much better by themselves and to forget what we alone could teach them, right? Uh, so uh, this is again education, is giving an opportunity for people to use their mind rather than indoctrinating them. Uh, uh, and therefore, he said, the first act of education should be purely negative, right? It consists not at all in teaching virtue and the truth, but in securing the health from vice and the mind from error. Very important, right? Uh, the task of education, not training, is not to tell you what the truth is, right? The task of education is to help your brain operate sufficiently to tell what is an error, right? And to figure out when you are making an error. Uh, that's why there is no easy solutions. There is no right answer to the question. There are competing answers to every important question, right? And the task of education is to consider the pros and cons, to consider what speaks for and against the evidence, and then to make a judgment, what is the proposition you will accept, right? To try to eliminate error. That's what education is all about. Okay, now, in another issue is about command. And he said, and again I love it, there shall be no commands. The words obey and command will be proscribed from the lexicon. And even more so, duty and obligation. Very provocative. But again, I think very deep. Think about it very hard, right? He said what we really should be in the process of education do is to emphasize your strengths, right? We emphasize necessity, we emphasize impotence, we, we, tell, we, we try to figure out what is outside of our reach, what we cannot do. We emphasize constraints, realistic constraints upon our action, right? Um, uh, that is really what should happen in, in education. So uh, the argument, this is your duty to do that, is the wrong way to approach, right? It's not what the educators should do, uh, to appeal to people's uh, um, uh, guilt feelings, to create guilt in them. We will talk about this more in Nietzsche, right? where the guilt feelings is coming from. Uh, no, don't create guilt, uh, but on the other hand, tell people what is necessary. Uh, what are the limitations of your action? Emphasize what you are capable of doing. Encourage them to get the best out of them, but always warn them that I don't see that you can really go that far. Don't push yourself too much because you won't be able to make it. That's what he believes education is. Now, this is uh, turning savages into social um, uh, being, moving from amour de soi to amour proper. The love of oneself, amour de soi, is always good. There is nothing wrong about it, what Adam Smith will call, right? Self-interest. Um, well, uh, the child is born with amour de soi, takes the toy away, it's mine, right? Uh, the other child will say, no, this is mine, right? This is amour de soi, I want it, right? Amour de soi, as we will know from uh, um, Freud, I want the breast of my mother, 
right? I want to monopolize it. This is mine, right? That's amour de soi. Well, but on the other hand, uh, we have to extend uh, our relationships. We have to interact with other people. Um, and amour uh, the proper will be when we realize that it's another people who are also led by amour de soi, and we figure out the way how to live with them uh, by interacting with them. Well, there are, how does it, well, does sociality then come from? Amour proper, where does it come from? And there are, the first maxim is, it is not the human heart to put ourselves in the place of people who are happier than we, but only of those who are more pitiable. It's a ironic, but as far as I can tell, Home run. This is a home run, right? Think just very honestly about yourself. Right? When you know somebody was more successful with you, you can't, very hard to love that person, right? If somebody is less successful than you, you feel pity for them, suddenly your heart warms up. Suddenly you feel responsible, right? Suddenly you want to call, right? Uh, the second maxim. One pities in the others only those ills from which one does not feel oneself exempt. So we don't necessarily led by love when we see misery what is sort of outside of our possible experiences. We, we have love for pitiable people when we think we can actually end up in the same situation. That's when we will have a more proper. And the third maxim is, well, the pity one has for another misfortune is measured not by the quantity of that misfortune, but the sentiment one attributes to those who suffer it, right? Um, so I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, and now about uh, compassion and pity one more time. He said they are born twice, once to exist and second time to live for speci species reproduction. And the young adult becomes sensitive before knowing what he is sensing. Uh, is now a man truly born to live and it beginning to experience the others. Um, so it is actually our weakness what makes us social, not our strengths. It is our common miseries which turns our hearts to humanity. I think really ironic but very deep ideas. You can disagree with it, but you have to think about it as that it's clearly an element of truth in the argument. Uh, okay, uh, and I also love the last <coughs> sentence here. He said, pity is sweet. This is one of my favorite sentences in Rousseau, right? It is so sweet to feel pity for somebody. Oh, I am so sorry for you, right? Then your heart is overflow, right, with love, right? Uh, well, and then the citizen and the bourgeois. This is, again, fantastic. Pedaretus runs for council of 300. He is defeated, not elected in the 300 representatives uh, in Sparta. He goes home, delighted. Uh, there were 300 men worsier than he to be found in Sparta. This is the citizen. Are you a citizen? Uh, when you only got a B minus, when there are 30 people in class who got an A, do you feel how fortunate I am 
that I'm in such a great class that 30 people are better than I am, right? If you feel that way, then you are a citizen, right? Then you develop amour proper, right? That is his point. And then another point. A Spartan woman had five sons in the army and was waiting news of the battle. A helot arrives, trembling. She asked him for news. Your five sons were killed. And now she answers, Base slave, did I ask you that? We won the victory. The mother runs to the temple and gives thanks to the gods. This is the female citizen, right? My children died, but we won the general will. Well, uh, he who in a civil order wants to preserve the primacy of the sentiments of nature does not know what he wants. Always in contradiction with himself, he will never be either man or citizen, he will be a bourgeois, he will be nothing. That's what Karl Marx loved, right? People who just pursue their own self-interest is not much. No. Men, women, sexuality and love. Well, civilization becomes culture when sex is sublimated. Bodily desire is turned into imagination. We will see that is greatly inspires Sigmund Freud. There are two mechanisms which constitute social, compassion, pity, and love. And he also adds a, a very provocative idea his time in kind of foreshadows postmodern thought. Um, enlightenment demythologizes the world, deprived from its meaning. It's a cold, rational world of the marketplace, right? And competitive, isolated individuals. That's what modern world enlightenment produced. And the world became unerotic, unpoetic. This is something which will play a big role in Max Weber's idea of disenchantment, uh, or if you know Marcuse's wonderful book, Eros and Civilization, comes straight out of Rousseau. Rousseau wants to bring back the erotic, not sex, the erotic experience. Well, the love develops in three stages. As I said, quest. First is a uh, quest. You are in love, but you don't know yet with whom. Again, think back. You were 13 or 14. Uh, you begin to search for somebody uh, to love. Then comes the discovery. You found it. That's it. That's the person I am loved with. Emil finds Sophie. What brings them together, he said, is the differences, right? That they complement each other. Uh, Durkheim will argue it can be similarity what brings us together. Uh, it's a more complex argument. Um, but the origin of the idea is in Rousseau. Then comes the important part. Once you fall in love, don't rush, right? As I said, not sex, eros is what he's believing. Leave, right? Uh, don't rush to bed. Go to travel, right? And then when you travel, you think about the person you love. You idealize that person in your mind. And that's when you, it, this, this love becomes an erotic experience. Then you can go home and you can consume the love, right? I think this is really... Uh, Wonderful. Well, and here comes a problem. Uh, his views on gender relations. Well, well, men and women are different. And that uh, means that they ought to be taught differently. Um, uh, If you would decide, he said, uh, to raise uh, uh, women, my, my, uh, women like men, he said, men will be gladly consent to this. Uh, the more women want to resemble 
men, the less women will govern them. Well, you can say it's a pretty sexist observation, uh, but probably the idea you heard before, right? Uh, um, who wears the hat in the family? This is the kind of argument, right? Uh, that women are the bosses after all. Uh, well, therefore, what the education should do, cultivate men's qualities, uh, 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 not, not to cultivate men's qualities in women, right? Uh, but uh, uh, raise it differently. Well, and here are the citations which shows you Rousseau the sexist. Uh, Hard to say he's not a sexist <laughs> bastard, right? <laughs> Women is made specially to please men. Uh, well, I'm sure at least half of these, the men in this room are also outraged. And I think probably all women <laughs> are outraged. Uh, but I hope there are other men in this room, not only me, who is upset by this statement. Well, he said, uh, Women and men are made for one another, but their mutual dependence is not equal. Men depend on women because of their desire. Women depend on men because both of their desires and their need. Uh, we would survive more easily without them than they would without us. I mean, men. I mean, this is of course straight silly, right? Uh, I mean. I was widow for a while. I know how, how, how much more difficult it is for men to survive without a woman than for a woman to survive without a man. Well, and then he goes on. Almost all little learn, uh, girls learn to read and write with repugnance. But as far as holding needle, that they always learn gladly. Sewing, embroidery, and lace making come by themselves. So, I mean, nothing more should be said, but there are other citations. Read this one. And there are some post-feminist feminists who actually like this Rousseau, who says men and women should be different. Uh, he said Sophie ought to be a woman as Emil is a man. And then he goes further. He said, in everything not connected with sex, woman is a man. In some ways, he's formulating the idea of the gender, right? Gender equality, sexual differences, right? That's what he said. The problem is if women try to look sex-wise like if they were men, right? Um, that's, I think, an interesting idea. And then he said, everything men and women have in common belongs to the species, the human species. And everything which distinguishes them belongs simply to sexual differences. Uh, and then he said, in the union of sexes, each contributes equally to the common aim, but not in the same way. Well, uh, I will suspect that most of you will see him as a sexist, uh, but some of you may actually see uh, the points what he's making uh, in these last sets of quotation. Thank you.